a group of people to be considered a church. Does the Bible tell us which features identify a genuine church? Welcome to Through the Bible. With our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, I'm Steve Schwetz, and as we begin our study in the New Testament book of 1 Timothy, we'll discover the answers to these questions and so many more. Now, while you turn in your Bible to Paul's first letter to his young protege named Timothy, I'm excited to invite Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, to update us on our mission of taking God's whole word to the whole world. So thanks for being here, Greg. Where in the world will you take us today? Well, good to see you, Steve, and good to be with our whole listening family. And today I want to take us to the Middle East, the Arabic-speaking world, and more specifically a place where you and I have been, which is Alexandria, Egypt. Egypt. Yes, yeah, yeah. not Alexandria, Virginia, Alexandria, <laughs> Egypt. Yeah, and what a trip. We were together for a significant milestone for our Arabic satellite TV project, which Mm -hmm. I have said is the most complex, ambitious project in our 52-year history, other than Dr. McGee doing the five years. i got to give him credit for a huge task. But it is an amazing ministry. You were there when they recorded the last of the five-year series. You remember that? Yeah, and what an emotional time that was. First of all, for the entire crew, you know, you think about Dr. McGee, he would literally walk drive down to the office, walk into his his study, and teach. And that's what you hear on these broadcasts. But for these folks, they actually took a floor of a high-rise building that was used as a church on Sunday and converted it into a soundstage with three cameras, two of them on booms, a whole set. The number of people that volunteered to make that happen every week, one week a month, was incredible for six years. Yes, and there was one man who was there through it all, and his Mm -hmm. name is Ayad Zarif. And you met him. He's a beautiful brother, loves through the Bible. He was the host of the program. And after you saw the completion of the five years, we did something we very typically do, which is we gave them permission to say, would you like, could you improve it? Could you do it better? Even Dr. McGee did it three times. So we, we think it's okay to give people a second shot. And so what what they said is, we'd really like to do two things. One is, we'd like to produce a video version of what we in the U.S. and Canada call Briefing the Bible. Mm-hmm. It's 100 programs that covers the whole 66 book. They call it Panorama. And then they went and re-recorded the first season. Right. So what they just completed was the full recording. And now we have a complete package, and we will be able to just keep airing that just like we do in English. And I add, wrote this email that we want to share with you. It says, let me thank you so much for the honor that you gave to me when you put this huge task in my hands to do it. It was a six-year journey. It was a very long journey. It was a very difficult time to spend in script preparation, guest coordinating, being away of home and children, and spending a week every month for six years in recording and following up broadcasting and viewers' feedback, but also they were six full years of mercy and grace and unlimited number of testimonies for goodness of the Lord. It was amazing to do a very huge number of episodes with nonstop commitment. Praise the Lord. Yeah, and he actually adds those episodes up, and it it ends up being over— 1500 yeah. different episodes that they recorded yeah. and and Steve you you've probably done a couple thousand of the opens and closes yeah. over the many many years but to do a full program and as I had said he wasn't just the the face he wasn't just yeah. the host he was the coordinator. he was coordinating he was working with scripts and the reason we want to share this with you is we want you to know this is why we ask you to pray all the time because the work that gets done out there around the world it's hard hard work it requires discipline Discipline. It requires commitment and, yes, sacrifice. And so we want to ask you to be praying for our Arabic ministry as it goes forward with the completion of this amazing, amazing television project. Let me just read the end of this. I add also adds at the end. Actually, the first winner before all viewers is me. You gave me the chance to study the Bible regularly and deeply before presenting the study to nations in many languages. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's a, a recurring theme that we hear. People that have to study the Word of God themselves are blessed as a result of yes, that. Yes, we hear that all the time from the producers. Greg, why don't you pray as we begin our study? Heavenly Father, we are so humbled that you get 
to give us a, a small part of this huge chain of people and purposes and, and resources and people praying and people working to bring your word to the ends of the earth. We pray that you'll bless those efforts, make your word fruitful as it goes out around the world today and in our own hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we've come today to First Timothy, and we've come to a new set of epistles. They are written by Paul. There are three of them that belong together, and they are called the pastoral epistles. And the reason that they're called that is because they have to do with local churches. Now, I think that you would find that these pastoral epistles are in contrast, for instance, to the epistle to the Ephesians. There, Paul speaks of the church as the body of believers that's in Christ today, the glorious, wonderful position that the church has. Now, that church, which is invisible, which is made up of all believers that are in the body of Christ, it manifests itself down here upon the earth in local assemblies, that is, in local churches. Now, just to put a steeple on a church and a bell in the steeple and a pulpit down front and a choir law and to sing the doxology doesn't mean it's a local church in the New Testament sense of the word. There are certain identifying features. I have a little book called The Spiritual Fingerprints of the visible church. And it must manifest itself in a very definite way down here to meet the requirements and meet all of the definition of a local church, to be a church of the Lord Jesus. Now, these three epistles were written actually to two young preachers, and we'll talk about them as we come to them. And these three young men were part of Paul's fruit. That is, they were led to Christ through the ministry of Paul the Apostle. And he had these men with him as helpers. And this young man, Timothy, and this young man, Titus. And he tells them about the local church. And I personally think that in all three epistles that you're dealing with actually two things. You're dealing with the creed of the church and then the conduct of the church, the church within, the worship must be right. And without, the church manifests itself in good works. Worship inside, works outside. That's the way the church is to manifest itself. Now, a local church must have certain things. And Paul, in all three epistles, will deal with these very definite things. And actually, instead of saying three, I should say really two, that which is inside, that which is outside. But he divides, for instance, First Timothy, and I'll come back to this again. Chapter 1, faith, the faith of the church, its doctrine. Chapter 2, the order of the church. Chapter 3, the officers of the church. Chapter 4, the apostasy that was coming in chapters 5 and 6, duties of the officers. Now, when you get over to 2 Timothy, you see the afflictions and the second chapter, the church is active, and you see the apostasy and then the allegiance of the church. And in Titus, you have first the order in the church. Again, same thing, the doctrine in chapter 2, and then the good works of the church in chapter 3. So it's creed on the inside conduct on the outside, within its worship, without its good works. Now, the church, to manifest itself in a local assembly, it puts up a building. Now, in Paul's day, they didn't have a building committee. That's one thing they didn't need, because they were not building churches. They generally met in homes, and I think probably in public buildings. We know in Ephesus that Paul uh, apparently rented the school of Tyrannus, a place where there was a school conducted, and Paul apparently used the auditorium during the siesta time each day, and people came in from everywhere to hear him 
preach, and that could be characterized as a local assembly, and it certainly became a church in Ephesus. And the church, therefore, in order to be a local assembly, there are certain things that must characterize it. It must have a creed. Its doctrine must be accurate, must be right. And Paul says here, and I think that in First Timothy, that there are two verses that are set before us, the message that's here in, in the first chapter, verse 3. Here's what he says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, or that they do not teach a different doctrine. And that's pretty important, that the church have the correct doctrine. And that's what we mean when we say a steeple doesn't make a local church by any means. And then in 1 Timothy 3.15, he says again to this young preacher, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now that local church is to be made up of believers who are members of the body of Christ. Now in order for them to function, they do have to have somebody to sweep the place out. They have to have somebody that will build a fire in a stove, if that's what they have. The first little church that I had, I swept it out some, not all the time. And then on Sunday morning, the first one that got there built a fire in the stove. It was a country church, and the first one there built a fire. I always tried to be a little late, but I'd say half the time there I built the fire in the stove. Those are things that are essential. And you do need a choir. It's nice to have one, a song leader. It's nice to have officers. In fact, he's going to say it's essential for it to be an orderly church. There must be officers, and they must meet certain requirements, and that the church should function in an orderly manner and manifest itself in the community by its good work. Now, that sounds very idealistic, and unfortunately, today it is idealistic in most places because the local church doesn't always manifest what it should. Now, from these pastoral epistles, there have come today three different types of church government that have been manifested by churches in the past, the great denominations actually never disagreed in the old days on doctrine as much as they disagreed on this matter of church government, how the local church is to function. And out of these pastoral epistles, there grew three different forms of government. And you marvel that they could get three forms of government, but they did. And I'll mention them. First of all, that which is known as the Episcopal form of government. That is where there's one man at the top who is in charge, or there may be several that are at the top. And the Roman Catholic Church calls him the Pope. In other churches, they're called bishops, or the archbishop. The Church of England has that system. And many other denominations have that form of government, an Episcopal form of government where it's run by a man out of the church who's up at the top, or a little group of men at the top. That's the Episcopal form. And then there is what is known as the Presbyterian or representative form of government. The church elects certain men to be officers, elders in the church, and deacons in the church. And church government is in their hands as far as the local church is concerned. But unfortunately, the churches were bound together by an organization above the local church, and that organization could control the local church. And that was another method, and it functioned for many years, and functions today, of course. Then there is the other extreme form, that is, from the Episcopal, there is the congregational form of government, 
and the congregational form of government. You see it, of course, in the congregational church and in the Baptist church. That is, the people are the ones that make the decision, and they are the ones that actually are in control. The entire church votes on taking in members. The entire church has to vote on everything of the local church. And that is the other extreme from the Episcopal. And you'd say, well, how in the world can they get three forms of government? Well, as we go through, we'll attempt to call attention to that in 1 Timothy and these other two pastoral epistles. It was the interpretation, actually, of words, the way that they interpreted certain words. Now, the very interesting thing is, in the early days, all three forms of government function and seem to work well. But in recent years, all three forms of government seem to have fallen on evil days. They don't seem to work as they once did. And I hear men that are members of all three forms of government that tell me today that there is the internal strife and internal disorder today and dissension. And what is wrong? Immediately, somebody says, well, the system is wrong. And by the way, we have a representative form of government in this country, and it is based on church government. It was patterned after it. You see, the early colonists, they didn't want a king. That's the only form of government they knew, but they had had enough of a king. They did not want an autocratic form of government. And they were rather reluctant to let the people rule. That may seem strange to you when you listen to local politicians today, but when you talk about everybody having a vote and that sort of thing, in the early colonists, women didn't vote, and those that were not landowners, they did not vote. Only those that had property and only a certain elite class were the ones that voted. Now, the reason they would not have a king to rule over them is because they couldn't trust human nature, and that means they couldn't trust each other. Now, we think of those men as being wonderful political patriotic saints. Well, they were human beings filled with foibles, and they knew they couldn't trust each other, so they would not put power in the hands of one man, and they were afraid to put it in the people hands because they had no confidence in the people either. And that sort of destroys the idea that the politician gives you today that when the people speak while you hear the voice of God, that the voice of the people is the voice of God. Well, frankly, that's just not true. What is it, though, that's wrong? People say our form of government. What's wrong? Well, now, I want to say something now, and I hope I'm not misunderstood and I recognize my inability to express it in the way I'd like to express it to you, but that I believe that Paul is saying in this epistle here that the important thing is not the form of government, but a form of government is important. The important thing is that the character of the men who are holding office that they be a certain caliber and have a certain character. Now, as far as this is concerned, as far as this epistle of 1 Timothy is concerned, and it'll be true in the other two, these men must meet certain requirements, a husband of one wife and that type of thing, and they must be sober and all of that. Now, as essential as that is, and that is argued so much today in local churches, And here's something that I never heard argued in my long years as a pastor, 40 years. And this is what Paul is trying to say to us, and I hope I can get that through. And it's this, that the men who are officers are the ones that must be spiritual men because no system will function unless the men are right who are in the place and position of authority. If they're wrong, no system will work. And whether it be congregational or Episcopal or Presbyterian, none of them will work when the men are wrong. 
And that, my friend, is the problem today. It's the problem today in politics. It's the problem in the church. We elect a man. He must be a successful businessman. He should be a man that has leadership ability. And very frankly, I think those are good requirements. But we need to recognize that is he a spiritual man? And the two things that Paul is going to emphasize here, and I'll point that out now so that when we get to it in this epistle and these others, that it will be very clear. They must be men of faith, and they must be men who are motivated by love. And unless those two operating in their lives I don't care how much ability they've got. They can't function in the church. Now, that means simply this, that the authority they have actually is no authority at all. I hope now I'll be able to make this clear to you. What is Paul going to say? Paul's going to say you've been made an officer, an elder, or a bishop, or a deacon in the church. All right? You have an office. Now you feel very pompous. You have authority. Paul says you have no authority. Well, then what do you mean? I mean simply this, that Christ is the head of the church, and the Holy Spirit is the one to give the leading and the guiding and direction. And the officer is never to assert his will in anything. He is to find out what the will of God is. And that means he'll have to be a man of faith. He'll have to be motivated by love. My friend, may I say to you, that's the only kind of man that ought to ever be an officer or a minister in a church. A man of faith and motivated by love. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going around and soft soap everybody and rub their back and try to be a man pleaser. The thing that he's going to try to do is to carry through the will of Christ in that church, and that he is to make it clear that Christ is the head of the church, and that his job is to see that Christ is the head of the church. Oh, how I've spent weary hours in board meetings talking about some little thing that has actually nothing to do with the spiritual welfare of the church, but it had a lot to do with the will of some hard-headed, stubborn individual who thought he was a spiritual man, and he had no idea that he wanted to carry through the will of Christ. To begin with, he'd never sought the will of Christ. All he was attempting to do was to assert his will because he thought his will was right. Oh, my friend today, Christ is the head of the local church. And if he's not the head of the local church, and we're going to see that in this first verse, he says here, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the Lord. Remember, that's number one. And the Lord Jesus said in his day, you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not the things I command. A lot of people calling him Lord today in the church and they're not following him at all. My friend, to be an officer in the church means that you're carried through the will of Christ, his command, his desire. He is the head of the local church. That's needed today, is it not? And the form of government. Therefore, I've said all of this to say to you that I'm not prepared to argue with anybody about your form of government. If you think yours is the best form, fine. You go along with it. But my friend, it will work if you have the right man. It won't work, and I don't care what form it is, if you have the wrong man in. That's the thing that has stopped the machinery today. That's the monkey wrench in the machinery of the church. And that's the reason as it gets down here where the shoe leather hits the sidewalk, why we don't see much evidence. Of Christ. That's the business of the church, is to get him through to the world. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, Dr. McGee was certainly clear. What's truly important is that Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and our mission is to proclaim his message. 
And that's also what Through the Bible is all about. So thank you to our faithful prayer warriors, those that we call our world prayer team, and thank you to our generous supporters who make it possible for us to proclaim God's Word in more than 120 languages and dialects all over the world. You know, and I don't know if I say it enough, but it's really true. It's such a huge factor to have you involved praying and supporting what the Bible bus is doing around the world. So if you'd like to join us in lifting up the ministry in prayer and through your financial support, just give us a call at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And you can also visit us at ttb.org forward slash give. And you can always write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And why don't you hop aboard the Bible bus tomorrow for another exciting study in 1 Timothy. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be right here saving a seat just for you. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.